Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amatana Santi, and I'm speaking from Santa Rosa, California, and I'm live streaming to the Dharma Punks Against the Stream group in Denver, Colorado. And there are a few friends who weren't able to make it to that meeting. And so they asked me to live stream it so that they could see what was going on. Um, I wanted to talk this evening about rupture and repair. You know, just as a background, as a context, I have taught it against the stream communities in Santa Monica and Melrose in San Francisco, in Seattle, in San Jose, in New York, in Santa Cruz, in Boston. And so I have a really strong affinity with the against the stream community, as well as the against the stream community in Denver were the only group that was really taking care of me when I came back to this country. And so there's an, a tenderness, there's an affinity that I have for this community and have felt tremendously welcome and uh, tremendously supported, as well as a lot of kinship with the kind of um, what I would say is a bullshit free zone that I experience in the against the stream community that I don't often see in some of the other insight meditation groups. This kind of like, you know, balls to the walls, all hell's gone loose. I want to wake up and it doesn't really matter uh, what it takes. And I am prepared and I don't want, I don't want bullshit and I don't want stuff that doesn't make any sense to me. I want the real truth. And so for me, there was always kind of this electric homecoming when I would be with against the stream communities because there was an affinity. I feel the same way. And I also have, you know, my own experiences of challenging things that were not well received and navigating a community that was in a massive rupture. So I want to speak a little bit about my own personal experience of rupture and then talk about in a general way how how we can navigate it, because it's my own experience was devastating. And I, you know, I, I feel the ripples, you know, I feel the waves, I feel the impact, knowing that against the stream community is dissolving. And, you know, people are like, you know, what? what what happened you know how come we how come it's like this how come how come we can't do it any differently you know so let me just backtrack a moment and talk about my own personal experience and then tie it in with what's happening here and see if we can learn from my experience and see if there's anything that's applicable I was a monastic for many years and in the monastery that I lived in, there was a, a, a difference between the status of the monks and the status of the nuns. And over many years, there was incremental training, uh, incremental efforts to see if we could have a little bit more um, uh, place, authority, autonomy, uh, security, safety. Um, and we made tremendous progress as a community over the 30 years that we were together. And then there was a whole bunch of things that happened and there ended up being a massive patriarchal retrenchment. And it was as if the time had been turned back many years and um, there were all kinds of things that were being said that were not in accordance with the Dhamma and harmful and hurtful to us as a women's community and hurtful to us personally and insulting and 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 we were in shock you know what on earth is happening and why is this happening and 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 so we were trying to figure out what on earth is happening here and why is this going on but we were not in the position of being able to have a, a an an independent investigation. And there was no letter of acknowledgement of what had happened. There was no result of an investigation. And so in our own personal experience, or at least my experience, I can't speak for the other nuns, there was this massive amount of confusion and a feeling of betrayal and, and dismay that, that, that this can stuff can happen in a community of people who are like hardcore lifetime committed to awakening, okay? That the leaders of the community were, were dishing out stuff to the nuns that was 
unpalatable. You know, it was not acceptable. And we didn't have an easy recourse recourse as a way of negotiating it. So I said, okay, time out, guys. All right, you know, I love you, but I did not sign up for this kind of stuff and I'm out of here. And that was the context where I left England and I came to the United States. And, and it took me years, uh, years to kind of wrap my mind around what had happened. And I don't want to go into all the specifics because I don't think it's particularly relevant um, for your circumstance. But I was devastated and also homeless because my spiritual home had been connected to the monastery in England. And I pulled myself out of that because I said, I cannot be connected to a community where in my situation, there was no uh, valuing of a person's integrity. So I made a decision based on my integrity and, and, was, and was slammed for that very, very hard. And so I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to play. It was like, this is not the game that I signed up for. And if this is the way that you guys are going to play, I'm not interested. So I left, but I was shaken and I was shaken into the marrow of my being, trying to wrap my mind around what happened. You know, what, what happened? How is it possible? How on earth is it possible that you can have a, a community of people who are committed to awakening and dish out this kind of stuff, which I experienced as directly harmful with no recourse as a way of addressing it and no accountability of what was going on or a community response that made any sense to me at all. So what ended up happening was the community of nuns kind of um, had a really big impact and more than half of the nuns who were in the community left and of those half that left, more than half disrobed. I stayed for eight years as a nun and lived as an independent. And there were satellites of other nuns in Ananda Bodhi and Santachita and, and Santusika uh, are independent and Aya Upeka is independent. Um, but most of the other nuns that were in the community have since disrobed. So, so we're left with this massive amount of cognitive dissonance between the actual teachings and the direct experience of what happened. And in my situation, no forum. There was no the teacher's council. There was no uh, board of directors. There was no grievance council that was engaged in any kind of a process of reparation to help hold it. I was on my own with the support of friends and support people, therapists and and healers and the land to help me make sense out of this mad shit really that went on. I mean, it was just like, you've got to be joking kind of stuff, okay? So this is in a monastic community, all right? With people who are committed to a high level of integrity and a tremendous level of the, the tradition is renowned for a tremendous level of integrity and, and renowned for keeping a very high level of purity. And in this context is where it happened, all right? So it is, and it is devastating. You know, I left, I left England and came to this country and it took me five years before uh, I could release some of the trauma of that experience out of my system. And so it absolutely is uh, uh, disconcerting, it is confusing, it is disorienting. There's a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance around trying to wrap your mind around how on earth is it possible that these things can happen from teachers who are not only committed to integrity, but many, 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 many years, decades of practice. Okay, so uh, there's a whole kind of story around why this stuff happens. And it might be helpful for me to share you what my explorations came to in terms of being able to understand it because of the eventual, there's levels there's the level of navigating the trauma. So I had personal impact. You know, my body felt as if I had been physically assaulted, even though I wasn't physically assaulted. 
I had other assaults coming at me and my body experienced it and internalized it as if it was a physical assault. And so there's the physical healing. There is emotional healing of trying to come to terms with what happened and making sense of it. Then there's the faith component of how on earth can this take place in a community that is committed to awakening? And then there's the practicality of, well, now what do I do? And where do I practice? And who are my peeps? And what, what do I do with my life and my passion for awakening? And do I throw the whole thing out? You know, are there pieces that are worth saving? What's worth salvaging? What's not worth salvaging? What is really important to question? And so there's all of these different things that are going on. And when it happens all together, it is overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. And so I was grateful that I have good friends and I have a loving family. And I'm also smart when I know that I've had a trauma uh, in my system, I get some support to release it. And so I did some trauma work and that helped. But I was also living right next to the Garden of the Gods. And that was tremendous because, you know, my system would have trauma uh, symptoms. I would be in some kind of a trauma vortex. I'd be shaking or quivering or there would be fire going through me or that my mind would tank into a despair or a depression. And I would go to the Garden of the Gods. And for me, the Garden of the Gods was tremendously holding and healing and allowing. And there was nothing that I could bring to those rocks, no level of despair. There was no level of, of discombobulation or disorientation that, that those rocks could not handle. And so for me, nature has been a tremendous ally, uh, particularly in these last 20 years of my life. And the, the Garden of the Gods held me in a, in a space where my mind could relax around the trying to figure it out and the wanting to get rid of the feelings that were unpleasant or trying to make sense out of the stuff that was so disorganizing and disorienting. And I would go and I would press my body into these 160 million year old rocks and the rocks to me felt like grandma's hugs. You know, they didn't feel hard. They felt delicious and soft and welcoming and just oh, so healing, you know, that there was something that was receiving me with care and kindness that I could trust, you know, it's like, what do you trust when you can't trust? You know, it's like, where, what do you do when you can't trust? You know, who are the people you can trust when the people you had trusted in the past were so disappointing and did things that were so hurtful and didn't acknowledge it, you know? So I would go to the garden of the gods and I would just let my body relax into the rocks and let them hold me. And as they held me, my mind would begin to unwind and I would move into the spaciousness of awareness. And in the spaciousness of awareness, the mind would stop trying to figure things out. It would release the identification with the sensations in my body, with the confusion in my mind, with the turmoil in my heart. And it would just move out into this wide open place that was expansive, that was peaceful, that was holding, that was loving, and that was ever present. And I would hang out there. And then, and then when I would hang out there for a long enough period of time, my attention and my awareness would come back into my body. And, and then from having connected with that, spaciousness, that awareness, I could come back into my body and I could feel, I could feel what was going on in my body from a different perspective. It was the perspective that actually had some view rather than being embroiled. 
And so when I was able to connect with something that I could genuinely trust, then it put into perspective the feeling of like, what do you trust when you can't trust? You know, it didn't, it, 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 it contextualized it. And so that I could see it as an arising concern within the context that I was navigating, but that was not coloring my whole experience. My experience was connected to something that in Buddhist language we could say was refuge, you know, that was timeless. And for me, my refuge and what was timeless, I had easiest access through nature. So then I would come back in my body, I would feel more calm and more settled and I wasn't so distressed. And then I would start to say, okay, so, all right, I'm not so distressed. How do I make sense out of what has happened? And then I think for me, one of the greatest things that has supported me in making sense out of what has happened is my parallel interest in study in the Ken Wilber's map of the developmental stages of uh, lines of development and stages of development. And so, because it was something that I was aware of, I was aware of before I left the monastery, you know, none of the nuns were oblivious to the fact that most of our teachers had quite a lot of stuff that hadn't been integrated, you know, it was clear to us. And, and so some of that stuff crystallized and came out in, in uh, really ugly ways and were, was incredibly harmful. And, and yet, so it was of an interest to me to try and understand what is actually happening here. And so for me, the, my, my study of Ken Wilbur and my study of integral maps really helped frame some of what we were navigating. And so the, the integral frame really explores the fact that from a developmental perspective, you know, we can be, have a tremendous amount of depth in a spiritual context, but on a personal level, there can be all kinds of things that are not integrated. And so um, you can, and we, I could see, I could see that living with the people I was living with in the monastery, it was obvious that this was the case. And so many of my teachers and many of my colleagues had really a profound understanding of the Dhamma and could speak eloquently about the Dhamma. But in terms of navigating some issues around power, some issues around misogyny, some issues around um, desire, uh, they hadn't done the work. And so that stuff was shadow. And that shadow stuff, when the conditions were ripe, came out. And sometimes it came out in ways that was ugly. And we navigated in the context of a monastic context where we used the monastic vinaya as much as we could to help support uh, coming to resolution around these things. But the nuns were in a precarious position because we didn't have the same legal standing as the monks and we didn't have the protection of the bhikkhuni patimoka. And so we were between, um, we didn't have the same legal standing. And so it was challenging to use the vinaya the monastic discipline to protect ourselves in the same way that a fully ordained Buddhist nun would have been able to because we didn't have that ordination. So we tried as best as we could to um, speak to issues from the perspective of the impact that was having on us and trying to bring a cohesiveness to the community as long as we could. And for me, that was a passion of mine to try and get the, the, the cohesiveness in the community to address this as a global concern so that we could move together as a group. And I tried as hard as I could with as much skill as I could until I realized that there was no more way to speak about it. There was no more things that I could say. And so I think on that level, there's a parallel with what I uh, have understood has happened in the Against the Stream community. And so, you know, I don't have any direct information from anybody about, I don't, I don't know anything about what was in the reports. I don't know anything like that. But what I think happened was that there was an effort to try and figure things out. And there came a point where the, the um, it became clear that it wasn't tenable any longer to try and continue. 
And so that clarity then meant even before the report came out that the, the inclination from many of the teachers was is that they were no longer interested in being connected and associated with against the stream. And so it wasn't a financial problem. It was a problem that they had reached a point where they were no longer interested in, in playing as a part of this game and that they wanted to move on. And so the, the consequence of that is, is that the, there's against the stream is, uh, is unsustainable. And so on one hand, it's, it's devastating. You know, the against the stream community has been a community that has served a, a large number of people who are sincere and dedicated. And on another hand, you know, this is the cause and effect of what happens when the rupture is at a certain level that it is beyond repair, that there's no way to actually repair the rupture. And so then you, what you do in the way that what I did was I said, okay, guys, I love you very much, but this is not what I signed up for. I'm leaving. And so I left England. I left the formal affiliation with the monastic community and came to the United States as an independent monastic, you know, with nothing thinking that just by the faith of the Buddha Dhamma and by the integrity of my practice, you know, I'll figure it out, something will work out. And I lived for eight years this way, and then it became clear that that was no longer serving me, and so I relinquished my monastic ropes. And I have no regret that I did that. You know, it hasn't been easy, to say the least. It hasn't been easy, but I have no regret. It was the right choice for me. And so I feel for the against the stream community, having come to this place of rupture, and now people are in a place of, well, well, now what? And how do we heal? And where do we move forward? And what's next? And what happened? And, you know, I was in the monastic community, you know, and I still don't know what happened. One of my colleagues who was a nun and disrobed, she says, I have no idea. I don't know what happened. So on some level, even if you are in the middle of it, and even if you are in the inside circle when it's all happening, there is still is, I don't know what happened. So there isn't a way that this question of what actually happened is going to be something that is going to be able to be answered. Because even in my situation, where I was in the middle of it, I still was left with, what happened? How on earth could this have happened? You know, how does this happen? So let me go back to Wilbur and the maps, and then I'm going to talk about repair, and then I'm going to stop and open up for questions. So the integral maps talk about different lines of development and you can be spiritually developed in some areas and be emotionally develop, undeveloped in other areas now from the buddhist perspective when you have attained to the first or the second level of awakening then there are certain things that it's just not possible to do you know after the second level of awakening the level of anger and ill will and desire has been mitigated. So there's some things that are just not possible to do. But the reality is that it is possible to be a charismatic and skilled Dharma teacher and still not have attained to those levels. And so it doesn't dismiss the goodness that has come from the skill, but it doesn't abdicate the lack of integration that is still needed, as well as the lack of sila, to, to prevent one from engaging in speech and behavior that is harmful. So it is true that it's possible to be a dedicated and committed Dharma practitioner. And in my situation, my teachers had been at it for decades and still have significant unintegrated issues around their own anger, around their ill will, particularly towards women, and the way that that came out. So the Wilbur maps actually paints a picture that says, this is actually something that you can expect. This is not unnormal. This is what you can actually expect, that a contemplative practice on its own by itself does not necessarily mean that everything is going to be integrated across the board. 
where people are not only going to be wise and compassionate, but they are going to be able to understand their own needs, be able to track them, be able to track them without them being at an expense of somebody else, and to be able to understand other people and diverse people's needs and be an ally and advocate for them. So in the monastery, you know, we went up and down between whether the nuns were loved and cherished or whether we were somehow, you know, like third class citizens that were just allowed to be there because they were being generous to allow us to stay. You know, it was just all kinds of nonsense that we went through. And we went through that for decades. And for me, I survived that or I was willing to go through that because my faith and conviction in the Dharma was so intense that I felt that even if the circumstances that I'm navigating have an awful lot of things in them that are unworkable, the Dhamma by itself is tremendously powerful and can lead to liberation. And so I was committed to liberation. That was my, that was what I was bought into. And it was only when I saw that there was a rupture with my capacity to trust and have confidence in the teachers personally and in that container specifically that I said, I can't do this in this particular context. So integration is not an inevitable process of meditation practice. And this is a disappointment for many people because I was told and the teachings come across to say that if you meditate long enough and dedicated enough, then that is all you need. All of the work that you need to do will be resolved through meditation. And that simply is not my experience. My experience is that meditation is absolutely invaluable, but we also need to do trauma work. And it doesn't automatically show up the places where we are not integrated around issues of our own hunger or fear of power. And it also does not necessarily show up around our unconsciousness around other people's needs. So having gone through all of this, how do we heal? How do we repair? How do we move forward? What do we do? Where are our people? Where are safe enough that we feel comfortable to go in and even trust enough to listen to what a teacher has to say? And I can share with you things that work for me, but I cannot answer those questions for you. I can encourage you to continue with those questions and continue feeling them out but I cannot give you the answer for what is going to be the thing that's gonna work for you. And so we first have to start with the immediate of where are we at? And if the immediate of where are we at is that we are completely traumatized, then we need to recognize that. And then we need to get safe. And then we need to get support that is trauma wise. Trauma wise is not usually about meditation. It's about a very specific way of titrating our attention with things that are pleasant, with the sensations that are connected to the trauma, so that we're not constantly reliving the loop of the story. What we are doing is moving into the unpleasant sensations and titrating it. It means doing it in a measured amount with also an um, a, connecting with where we feel safe, where we feel loving, the support that we feel from our friends, from our family, from nature, so that we are constantly moving back and forth in this like this weave of touching where we feel okay, and then coming back into the sensations where we're not. And trauma is best done with somebody who understands this territory and can help guide you. So even after decades of my own meditation practice, and even after the level of sophistication that I have about trauma, the attunement that I have about my own process, the trauma therapist that I work with last said to me, even with you, you are much better off working with a trauma therapist than trying to do this on your own. 
And so it's, it's humbling, but that's the truth. And so I seek out therapy when I am in a trauma vortex. And I probably need to do more of it than I have, you know, because there's been a lot coming at me. But so I encourage you to do that. Okay. So if you're in trauma, you need to have trauma support. If you are emotionally dysregulated, then what you need is to have friends and support around you that helps mirror to you. You're not insane. You're not nuts that all of this is disorganizing and dysregulating. That's a normal and natural response to have this level of disturbance in your world. Okay. Emotional dysregulation takes a while to heal from, and it's not a simple weekend project. What is helpful is to feel an affinity with people that you trust, who have a language that you resonate with, who have a level of integrity that you can respect, okay? There is a big question about how is it possible that people who are so committed to meditation practice can be so unintegrated? I mean, I was a monastic. My teachers were monastics. They were teachers for decades, and all of this stuff was coming out of them. It is a valid question. It is not an irrelevant question. It is a valid question. And this question actually needs to go back to the Dharma communities, to the teachers' councils, to ask this question of how is it that the teachers are coming out of this process where there is such a lack of integration. And what can we do as a community of Dharma practitioners to increase the level of integration that happens? So when there are doubts that are worthy, then it's important to allow them to be there and to wrestle with the agony that they bring which is that the confidence that we had that the Dhamma is going to be able to help with everything is shaken. We recognize that we need other things. Now, I can talk more about my own personal experience of that and what I have done and why I advocate a whole life path and why I have an amalgamation that includes both the classical Dhamma teachings as well as as, as well as an, uh, as an understanding of our psychology and how to move between these two. You know, certainly as a life coach, this is what I do with my mentees, you know, as I help them with their Dhamma practice and I help them with their integration of where they're at psychologically. And this is what I want to teach and this is what I want to evolve. And so I'm interested in other meditation teachers who are in the same boat as me. I'm interested in collaborating together and finding ways to bring this out in a way where we bring about a greater level of integration in the communities, in ourselves, and in our mentees. That's what I'm interested in. So healing from something like this is not a small project. And for different people, depending on what's activated, it's going to be different things are going to be stirred up. When you've got allegations of sexual misconduct, when you've got issues of power dynamics, when you've got a whole community dismantling, you're going to have issues of homelessness and abandonment and betrayal. All of this is going to be up. And so on one hand, it's really, really shaky material. And on another hand, it's an incredible opportunity, you know, not to be Pollyanna-ish, to just put a pink smear all over everything. But when all of this material is activated, then it is ripe to be able to look at it afresh and to get underneath it from another perspective to see if there can be another layer of the onion clearing out. So for myself, I had to come back to basics. What do I trust? Okay, so there's things that I don't trust. I don't put my attention and energy into things that I don't trust. What do I trust? I trust that living with integrity does make sense. It does not make sense to harm people. So it doesn't make sense, even though I was harmed, to retaliate with harm. That does not make sense, okay? 
it makes sense to live with integrity myself. It also makes sense for me to have the kind of space to be able to heal in the way that I need with the time frame that I need. So for me, I was kind of wedded to the garden of the gods. And people tried to get me to move away from the Garden of the Gods because it wasn't practical to be living in Colorado Springs as an alms mendicant Buddhist nun. And it was like, I don't care that it's not practical. It might do me in, but the Garden of the Gods is my anchor to something that allows a profound healing and transformation. And so I would not, I wouldn't move. I wouldn't move. And there were times when I would have to run to the garden of the gods because I'd get activated and my whole system would be dysregulated. And I, I didn't have any way with meditation practice by itself to help me get regulated. So I would run to the garden of the gods and I'd lean into those rocks and they would help me. And so the practical reality of trying to move forward now with the communities dismantling is going to be something that each small community is going to need to figure out on their own. You know, the nuns were decimated. We scattered into the 10 directions. There are nuns on, in post-monastics on, on six different continents. I mean, it's just like all over the place, you know, four different continents. I don't know how many, but all over the map, okay? So it was absolutely devastating this 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 community that had been together in such an intimate and close way was scattered in the 10 directions with with hardly any way of coming back together again so then there's the question of division of who believes what and how you feel about the people who believe different than you do and so in my situation, there were people that absolutely were supporters of the monastery and the teachers and wanted to protect it at all costs. And they had very little capacity to actually hear what was going on for any of us that had been impacted in a really big way. They didn't want to know. And they were not interested. They were not very welcoming and they were not very supportive. And then there's the people who have been impacted, who feel a solidarity with each other, who've been impacted and feel a sense of dismissal and dismay about those that are on the other side. So I, when I was in Australia, I was living in a community and during the time I was living in the community, somebody had very, very serious sexual allegations of sexual misconduct against him. And I, and I spoke to the person in that community and asked her, you know, what happened around all of that? And she said, the nature of those particular allegations against that person was is that the community was divided. It was a divisive thing. And the reasons why in that specific circumstances, why it was so divisive was because the allegations were extremely serious and he denied them. And so there was those people who thought he was innocent and those people thought that the evidence was suggestive of the fact that he wasn't innocent. And these two sides were unreconcilable. And so my friend convened a meeting of both sides with this explicit purpose of trying to find what they had in common. And the only single thing that they had in common was that they could not bridge for the other side. If either side tried to bridge for the other side, they would be seen as betraying their side. So the one single thing that they both shared in common was that they could not bridge. Now, when they focused on that one small thread, that gave them a context where in that awareness, they were not trying to blame. They were not trying to figure out who was right. They were just cognizant of the fact that they shared that in common. They could not bridge between the two sides. So in this kind of a circumstance where there is division and it is systematic and there are going to be people that have different opinions and some people are going to continue to support Noah and his teachings and there are people who are not, 
there's going to be a systemic division in the, in the whole system. And so I offer this as one place to focus on as a way of moving into a, a, a place of focusing attention where blame has no foothold. It doesn't solve the trauma. It doesn't solve the emotional dysregulation. It doesn't solve any of the logistics that individual communities are needing to navigate about what do they do, who are they affiliated with, where do they practice, who do they practice with, but it gives a tiny little foothold that is free from blame as a place to move forward. So when we as ascribe to the precepts to do no harm, then that is to do no harm to ourselves, to do no harm to other people. That doesn't mean that we can't be angry and we can't be pissed off, but it is helpful when we're angry and pissed off that we speak in confidence to people who understand how to process that rather than use public media forums as a way of discharging our anger, particularly when we're targeting individuals in our discharge. Then there's the Dhamma. What is still true about the Dhamma? So in my own personal experience, I can see, and I can say with quite a lot of confidence, that I don't think the Dhamma is the only thing that people need in order to be integrated. But I haven't thrown it out of the, of the I haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. There is lots of ways that it's clear that when I focus on unskillful things, it has an unskillful result. When I focus on skillful things, it has a skillful result. The teachings of the Four Noble Truths still hold true. Many of the specific teachings are not discounted, even though I have questions about why there is still such a lack of integration in teachers after applying these teachings. So the teachings themselves still have truth in them, even though I would love to see a process where there is more integration in the teachers and in the communities particularly around the issues of power and getting people's needs met and advocating for diverse people's needs without it being at somebody's expense. So this is a lot and hopefully this is helpful. And I want to pause here and invite comments or feedback or questions. And because I'm also connected to the Against the Stream community in Denver, I'm going to ask them to speak. And if they speak, because I'm plugged in, I can hear them, I will repeat their questions and answer it. And if any of you who are listening have questions, I invite you to write them. But I am navigating this technology and I'm not great with technology. So forgive me if I, if I miss a question, okay? So you are invited on the live Facebook to ask your questions now and and I will do my best to respond. So um, for the Denver group, so my eyes are up because I've got another widget that I'm looking at uh, to see them. For the Denver group, if you guys have questions or comments that you wanna bring forward, my, my request would be that you, you come close enough so that I can hear you speak. Maybe before we start with questions, do you want to share impact? What's the impact of listening to me?
So the comment was there was an appreciation for um, uh, there was an appreciation for my experience of speaking about in the monastery and to recognize that teachers uh, teachers may have a be able to speak about the Dhamma and still have work that they need to do themselves. Any other impact? Can I just can I just pause you and and share what you're saying? Yeah. So the person, okay, okay. So the person who's speaking is talking about uh, he's an active veteran and he's uh, been working a lot on his trauma, and his trauma has gotten uh, activated in the last two months and in particularly in the last two weeks it's been really intense. So let me let me just pause you. So he's just coming out of a retreat. I, I don't know the name. Skills based. What is it? So a, 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 so it's a retreat, but a trauma based retreat. Is that right? Okay, so he's he's just come out of a retreat that was focusing on getting his emotional regulation back, and so it's, it's expressing the fact that there's synchronicity in what I'm saying, and he's a, he claims himself, calls himself a nihilist, and so I'm guessing that what that means for you is, is that synchronicity is not the normal thing that you have. Yes, okay. So please, the question. So the question is, is, is with somebody like this, like him, who's got the background that he described dealing with uh, the, such amount of trauma, what's the best angle in with the Ken Wilber maps? Well, I think you're doing it. You're totally doing it. You're actually engaging in the different kinds of therapeutic processes that help you navigate the things that you're working on. And as you experience more emotional regulation, then what is helpful is to have a practice that includes support so that you have more uh, skill, not only in the contemplative level, not only in, in the trauma realm, but also in understanding some of these other areas as well, physically, physical health, emotional health, developmental health, 
you know, creative health, um, things like that. Hmm. No, um, there isn't, a, you know, Ken Wilber is a very, very prolific writer. The two books that I have read of his that I really enjoyed, oh goodness, my brain, I, brain, okay, I, this will be a live Facebook post, so I'll post it as a comment at the end, okay, yeah, good, thank you. So, um, Let's see here. Let me just check and see what's happening on the Facebook Live. So there's one comment about there's a whole bunch of multiple live feeds that are going on right now, and what do you do? Well, one of the nice things about these live feeds is that they're all recorded so that you can listen to them later. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, you can just pick one and focus in on it, and then um, uh, you don't you don't need to worry about what's happening what you need to do is to move in the direction of where you feel the most nourished where you feel the most support not to worry about what's happening and and then from feeling nourished and supported then you will find a way forward in terms of what's next and what needs to happen are there other questions So there's a question about a teacher standing integrity, having power and not abusing it is something that I would like to study and learn about further. Well, I think as human beings, you know, one of the things that I say often is that people are people-ish, you know, and that's true for all of us, that people are people-ish and um, some things are very compelling and, you know, power is compelling. Power is not a gender specific thing that's compelling. It's compelling for both men and women and probably it's compelling for people who are bi non-binary. You know, I, power is something that is compelling. And so learning how to navigate power and talking about it, dealing with it, working with our, our hunger for it, our fear of it is not something that we teach directly in our meditation. So our meditation is based on the assumption that if we are able to um, penetrate sufficiently into the nature of greed, then that by itself is going to span through all of the hungers. And that does at very profound levels. But in the meantime, there can be ways that we can engage with understanding our hunger for power and our fear of power more directly. And so I think that there are things that the therapeutic world has as ways of teaching that are would be worthwhile for us to work with. It's not common to have a spiritual community that is uh, sophisticated psychologically and is interested in doing developmental work. And it's also very rare to have psychological uh, therapeutic uh, communities that are interested in the transcendent and timeless Dhamma. You know, to have a sense of something that is, you know, what's left when everything falls away. And to me, what this points to is the need to put both of these things together. Are there any other questions that are showing up in the group? Well, if, if not, then maybe let's just take a moment and pause and do a couple minutes closing loving kindness meditation, okay? So wherever you are, whether you are listening live or you're in the group in Denver, or whether you listen to this recording afterwards, wherever you are, just take a moment and, and, and let yourself feel at ease sitting. And just take a moment and turn your attention to what's present you know, I spoke a lot and it's quite possible that you feel activated by what I said. 
It's possible that you disagree with some things that I said. It's possible that you resonated with things that I said. So whatever is going on for you, just turn your attention for a moment and feel what is present in your body. Feel the sensations in your body. Feel the quality of mood that's in your heart. Feel the quality of mood that's in your mind. And just allow it to be there. It doesn't have to be in any way different. You are just right exactly where you're at right now. And bring a loving, embracing attention just knowing that. And as I do that, I just notice I breathe deeper and my spine elongates and my shoulders relax. And I release some tension that I'm holding. Even just talking about it, I release some tension that I'm holding. And now just to invite the question, can we bring a loving, embracing attention to the whole of our body, heart and mind, just now, just the way we are? And if the answer is no, then just relax with that no. You can't find it to bring it. And I invite you to bring to mind the image of someone or something that reminds you of loving, caring, embracing, affection, tenderness. Could be somebody that you know, it could be a friend it could be a, your, your dog or your cat that snuggles up with you, purrs. It could be a favorite tree or a, a rock friend that has just always been there. It, it absolutely doesn't matter. Just bring this image of something that's loving for you. And as you let your image fill up the quality of this being, or I call rocks people, so it's a being for me too. Let it fill up your mind and then let yourself feel the quality of love that is associated with that. And as you feel the love that is associated with that, let that love get stronger. And let it fill up your whole heart and chest and body. Let it soothe everything that feels frayed and torn and jagged and hurting and displaced and confused and angry and betrayed and pissed off, and resentful and numb, traumatized, and scared, uncertain. not by making any of those things go away, but by just touching them, embracing them, letting them be there. Just like a hug from a dear, dear friend. Seeing you, embracing you, just the way you are.
And so just filling that up, feeling that in your body. And it might be that it might take a while before you can fill it up in your body so that you have anything whatsoever to share. And trust that. Trust that. But as and when you have enough, you feel it enough to share. You can know that all of us, what we have in common is, is that we all can hurt. We can all feel scared. We can all feel confused. We all need love affection. Safety. But without pressurizing in any way whatsoever, just allow yourself to feel the love. Fill it up and let it spill over. As we are grounded in ourselves, as we take care of our own body, hearts, and minds, we are in a position to be a friend and an ally for each other. I want to end with one more thing. I was quite amazed on the Abayagiri website that there was the history of the forest tradition. In the history of the Thai forest tradition on the Abayagiri website, I don't remember how many years ago, talked about that the forest tradition has been around since effectively the time of the Buddha. And since the time of the Buddha, there has been a constant cycle of increase and decline, increase and decline, increase and decline. And usually what happens, or what they reported on the website that I remember, is that a teacher has inspiration and has insight and teaches. And the teaching then amasses wealth and fame. And the amassing of wealth and fame causes a degradation of standards of integrity. And the degradation of standards of integrity goes to a certain level. And then at that certain level, then there's a re-emergence, a resurgence of people who are interested in the genuine Dharma. And that re-emergence and resurgence causes another upwelling. And then that upwelling has some stars who are famous and the famous people have wealth accrued to them. And the wealth brings money and the money elicits and entices greed and power, and then it degrades. So the Thai forest tradition, as delineated by the Abayagiri website, at least when I read it a number of years ago, has had a cycle of increase and decline and increase and decline and increase and decline since the time of the Buddha. And so this has been going on a very a long time. It is nothing new. It is nothing, it's not any less devastating, particularly when it's us that we're navigating it with. But this has been going on a very long time. And so my heart is with you, just as my heart was absolutely devastated by what I went through. 
And yet I feel that the level of integrity that I have observed, the letter that the, was just sent out was incredible. I never received a letter like that. I was never in a, a place where I felt that people were willing to even hear what the complaints were and have an investigation. So the level of integrity from the Against the Stream Teachers Council and Grievance Committee and the Board of Directors was awesome. And together, bit by bit, with communities looking at who are the teachers, where are the affinities, the logistical complexity of what you're navigating will begin to sort out ways we'll find a way forward. And I feel with you in this process. So that's it for now. Bye for now.